Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. I always find these sessions a little bit interesting because for me, I'm in Fritjof's future. <laughs> I'm sitting here on a Saturday morning, seven o'clock in the morning uh, on uh, Saturday the 28th. For many of you, it will be still Friday the 27th. So welcome wherever you're calling in from. Uh, my name is Morag Gamble and I'm hosting this session here and I'm calling in from the unceded lands of the Gubby Gubby and would like to first before we begin pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and, and invite you all to if you know where the Indigenous uh, country that you're calling in from please share that in the chat but also please drop into the chat and, and um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, before I introduce Fritjof, I'd just like to tell you a little bit of, about what this session is and, and how we're going to operate today. So firstly, um, the title of this session is Systems Thinking Permaculture and Sustainable Communities. And uh, we're hosting this session from the Permaculture Education Institute because the work that we do here is entirely inspired by the interactions that I had with Fritjof way back in 1992 when I studied with Fritjof at a place called Schumacher College. And I remember very strongly Fritjof talking about the great challenge of our time is to build and nurture sustainable communities and to become eco-literate and learn to think systemically. So here at the Permaculture Education Institute, our key goal is, I'm just going to um, mute a couple of people, that's all right. Um, our key goal is to to teach teachers, the kind of teachers who can share out this work in building eco-literacy, teaching other teachers about eco-literacy and nurturing in and creating sustainable communities through a lens of permaculture, a very practical approach. Um, so for me, the work that I do today is deeply woven through to that um, connection with Fritjof 30 years ago. So thank you, Fritjof, for, for that mind-opening experience at Schumacher College and, and welcome to our session today. It's yeah, such a thank delight. you, Maura. You are one of my most, maybe the most brilliant student I've had at Schumacher College. And just so that everybody knows, this was a beginning of a long relationship, uh, both between our families personally and also professionally. We have done a lot of things together and I am really delighted that we are continuing our collaboration and very much look forward to this dialogue. Thank you so much, Fritjof. And I, in, in my heart, um, I hold you as one of my dearest and longest friends and um, one of the, the mentors who has shaped the way that I think and see the world because we met when I was young and my ideas were forming. So yeah, thank you so much. I'm yeah. really delighted to be able to share this conversation with you with our global community here. We have um, over 500 people who signed up for this session. This is one of the, a series of masterclasses that I host every month. And I, I open the doors uh, to these as free events to make sure that this kind of thinking and the ideas that we share here is made accessible as far and wide as possible. And I'd also like to thank any of you who are here who did make a donation when you came in. Uh, I haven't got the final tally, but when I looked last, it was over $1,000. 100% of this will be sent directly to our, our key partners with Perma Youth who are doing work in refugee communities. So refugees themselves who are designing and leading regenerative work in their community. So thank you very much for that. And thank you, Fritjof, for for donating your time to be here um, to pleasure. support that as well. Um, I wanted to begin our conversation here today with probably, you know, that, that big picture question about what is going on in the world today from your perspective and how do you see the current situation for humanity? We have so many crises from climate change to poverty to war mm. to biodiversity loss, everything that is we are facing how do you see this situation and, and the future for humanity? Just a little question. Well, well, yeah, but I think it's important to, to start with the big picture. When we look at the uh, state of the world today, at our multifaceted global crisis, to me, what is most striking is that none of our major problems, 
And you mentioned some uh, energy, environment, the climate catastrophe, economic inequality, uh, violence and war, and now also the COVID pandemic. None of these problems can be understood in isolation. They are systemic problems, which means that they're all interconnected and interdependent. And so you, we need to learn how to think systemically, to think in terms of relationships, in terms of context, in terms of patterns. And when we do that, we can find systemic solutions, solutions that do not deal with any problem in isolation, but always within the context of other related problems. And, you know, unfortunately, as, as you know, this is sadly absent among our political leaders, you know, uh, who uh, really, really think in, in terms of these outdated concepts. For example, that in the nuclear age, you can solve conflicts through war. This horror that we are seeing now in Ukraine is is based on the kind of block thinking that I remember well from my childhood in the 1950s and 1960s, where we had an Eastern Bloc and a Western Bloc and the Iron Curtain in between. And this is now, you know, horribly being revived both by Putin in Russia and by NATO, who subscribe to this kind of mechanistic block type thinking. So we, we need to shift from that to thinking in terms of networks, in terms of collaboration, in terms of cooperation. And, you know, that's really what our work is, is very much about, Morag, yours and mine. So you began your work um, in the 1960s with the counterculture and have been deeply involved as a as an author, as an educator, as an activist, uh, as a scientist for five decades. Uh, I've I've got your book here, um, the patterns of connection, which is your book, um, your recent book of um, essays from five decades. And I wonder whether you could just mention a little bit about your how you've noticed the change of how we're responding to what's in front of us from the counterculture to the global civil society and what kind of changes you feel like we need to be focusing on particularly today in well, this bigger picture? First of all, let me say that uh, the essays start in the 1970s, so I'm not that old. No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the five decades start in the 70s. Uh, well, you know, my my whole work as a writer, you know, I was I was trained as a physicist, spent 20 years doing research in theoretical physics, and then slowly shifted from physics to the life sciences and from being a working scientist or a working physicist to an author and a systems theorist. And uh the main uh, theme of my work over those five decades has been the profound change of worldview and values uh, in a nutshell from seeing the world as a machine to understanding it as a network. And this is a, a very deep change of metaphors, a change of paradigms. and. Uh, uh, in one of my first books in 1982, uh, The Turning Point, I uh, presented this image of a declining culture and a rising culture and a sort of a smooth change uh, of, of worldview and values. But it has been anything but, but smooth. So over these past few decades, I have witnessed scientific revolutions, but also backlashes, uh, a sort of swings of a pendulum, a, maybe a chaotic pendulum. Just to give you an example, there has been a huge resistance to this change of paradigms by uh, the giant corporations, uh, the fossil fuel industry, the uh, big pharma, 
industrial agriculture. And as a consequence of this resistance, we have seen uh, the climate crisis uh, increasing. We have seen these em new emergent viruses, which uh, jump from animals to humans because of the destruction of their ecosystems, massive human intrusion in, in their ecosystems. So it, it has been a rough ride, but I still believe that, that this change of paradigms is the main uh, characteristic of, of our era and that we need systemic thinking to deal with the problems of our time more than ever. Mm. And one of the things too that I wanted to ask you about is, you know, this transition that you you described and that system change is not linear though, is it? And how how do you perceive this tran the transition you know, when when we talk about a transition to a sustainable society, I think in our minds we want to imagine it to be this changeover. But how do we prepare for this? How? What are the kind of changes that we need to 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 take stock of, possibly? Well, uh, if you think of the change from the change of metaphors from seeing the world as a machine to understanding it as a living network. I mean, these are two very different images. And so in my view, the first step needs to be to understand living networks, to understand the nature of life. And so this is what my recent work has, has been about, to understand the nature of living systems and to use the principles of organization of living systems as principles of design. And this is being done, uh, as you know, in the discipline of ecological design, eco-design based on ecological literacy. Uh, more specifically, it is done in biomimicry, which uh, takes nature as a model and a mentor and designs uh, you know, human structure and, and, and human systems accordingly so that we are in harmony with nature. Um, I should also mention, I, I mentioned the uh, necessity of finding systemic solutions and systemic solutions because they solve problems within context uh, tend to solve several problems at the same time. And I always take agriculture as an example, which is the field you're working in more uh, with permaculture. Uh, if we shifted large scale from our in mechanistic, mechanical, highly centralized, energy intensive, chemical agriculture to a sustainable, regenerative, community-oriented permaculture, then this would solve or contribute to solving several of our major problems. First, it would uh, greatly uh, reduce our energy consumption because these sustainable practices have much less energy input. The organically grown food would have a huge impact on public health. And um, the, uh, these uh, agroecological practices would also contribute significantly to fighting climate change. And this is not generally known and appreciated because an organic soil, uh, a living soil, is full of carbon. Where does it get the carbon from? Well, it draws it down from the atmosphere, and that's what we need to do. So, you know, agriculture, forestry, and agroforestry uh, are the only known technology uh, that that is proved and tested that can draw down carbon from the atmosphere. So that's how we need to go. Mm. And and so this idea of the systemic solutions to respond to the systemic problems and and not just one solution, but a whole breadth of solutions of everyone everywhere responding to how they can, where they are. 
but basing that on a, a deep understanding of how nature works. And I, I wonder whether you might share with us now your, your latest research and conceptualization of, of what is life and, and how, how life works. Yes. Well, uh, I'd be happy to. I, I spent the last, say, four decades developing a synthesis of a newly emerging uh, systemic understanding in, of life at the forefront of science. I published this synthesis in various books. Uh, the one just before the one you mentioned is, is called The Systems View of Life, which I wrote with my colleague Pierluigi Luisi. And uh, I also teach this in an online course which is now widely known as Capra course because I've I've taught it now for seven years, and uh, so uh, there are a number of rather sophisticated theories that I have assembled into my synthesis, and in the book, in the textbook, and in the course, I go into these details. But I can tell you that recently. I found a completely non-technical way of summarizing these theories, and I can do this in 10 minutes for you. And I do so in terms of four characteristics of life that can be observed at all levels, from the smallest bacteria, through plants, fungi, animals, humans, ecosystems, and so on. So they are embodied in all forms of life. And the four characteristics are, one, life organizes itself in networks. So I've talked about the importance of networks. And also there's the idea that life organizes itself. These living networks are not imposed. The network pattern is not imposed on the living system, but it's created by the system itself. The second characteristic is that life is inherently regenerative. Now, we all know about the continual regeneration of life in nature. Just think of the turn of the seasons, new growth in every spring, and so on. What is new in the system's view is that this regeneration operates at all levels of complexity, down to the molecular networks in cells. So, regeneration is the very essence of life's self-organization. When you talk about you know, living systems being processes, and when you ask, well, what kind of process? What, what do they actually do? Uh, or you can also, to, be, to put it more dramatically, you know, what's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? And so on. Well, it's regeneration. Regeneration is the very essence of life when regeneration stops, life stops. The third characteristic is something that scientists found out very recently, that life is inherently creative. There is a constant possibility of spontaneous emergence of new order, new structures. This is a process that has been uh, investigated in great detail and is generally known as emergence. So the process of emergence, with, which is characteristic of all living systems, means that life is inherently creative. So we are not creative just because we may be artists or we may be designers or creative people of one kind or another. We are creative because we are alive, because life itself is creative. This is, I think, a huge discovery together with the regenerative processes of life. And finally, the fourth characteristic is that life is inherently intelligent. And that refers to a new a uh, concept of cognition, the process of knowing, which is rather complex. And, and to just summarize it briefly, maybe the best way I can do it is to say that uh, living organisms interact with their environment 
through sensory organs. And as uh, they become more complex biologically in evolution, so do their sensory organs and so do their cognitive processes. These interactions are cognitive processes. And I have recently used uh, an ancient term to describe this, the term of sentient beings, which you may have heard from Buddhist philosophy or from other philosophies, indigenous philosophy. Um, uh, living organisms are sentient beings. And in science, in the systems view, uh, these sentient interactions are uh, identified as cognitive interactions. So all living systems are cognitive systems. All living systems are inherently intelligent. So to just put it in one sentence, life organizes itself in networks, and these living networks are inherently regenerative, creative, and intelligent. And this is not only a completely non-technical summary, but I find it's also very evocative because, you know, regeneration, intelligence, creativity, this is something we know from our experience and we can relate to. So I've been very excited about using these terms. But I should say, in my book and in my course, I go behind that to the scientific theories, which are, are rather complex. In fact, based on complexity theory that was developed in the 1970s and 1980s. I wonder, Fritjo, whether you might talk a little bit about the life being sentient organisms and talk about our planetary system and Gaia and how that concept fits into your systemic view of life well as i as i said before all living systems are cognitive systems and the largest living system we know is our planet this is the famous gaia theory which says that the planetary web of life creates the conditions conducive to life and optimizes the conditions conducive to life. And this is a big shift from uh, the conventional idea of, of maybe 50 years ago, where scientists saw the Earth as a, a dead uh, rock, uh, you know, rock and water, rock, water, and atmosphere as the stage on which life somehow originated and evolved. Now we are seeing that from the emergence of the first bacteria, life has, conti has continually uh, influenced its environment and shaped its environment, and it continues to do so. I'm I I was just fascinated recently. I was sharing with the youth group that we take every every time you run the course through. We were watching together Lynn Margulis's film. And uh, what I think stuck with everyone there was this notion that there is this bacterial mat which covers the earth and is communicating. And so there's this communications network which connects all life. And we can also talk about that through the fungal networks as well, which shifts our understanding about how life works and how um, how communication and networks yes. happen between the systems. Ab absolutely. Actually, uh, maybe this has been the most important new development in the life science in the last couple of decades. Uh, the, the work of Lynn Margulis describing this uh, bacterial web that that covers the planet not only covers the surfaces but are also uh, you know inside other living organisms. I mean we are you know a walking ecosystem of of bacteria and and this has been 
uh, you know, recently uh, has found a lot of attention in, in the medical community, in healthcare community, that the so-called microbiome in our intestines is a really important factor of health. But I want to mention two other developments, and you mentioned fungi, and uh, this is uh, also uh, the discovery that fungal networks are sort of like a connective tissue throughout the earth, and with incredibly high degrees of intelligence. And the same is true for plants. You know, plants and fungi don't have nervous systems, but they have tips of um, of roots and tips of what is called hyphae in, in the fungal world that uh, serve like uh, communication uh, systems and, and observation systems, sensory organs through which both plants and fungi can uh, recognize and continually monitor the um, parameters in the environment like humidity, temperature, soil composition, soil structure, and so on. Uh, it's equivalent of, of a brain. So, so these developments have really confirmed the view of life being inherently intelligent. Intelligence is not limited to animals and humans, but is very widespread and very sophisticated also in plants, fungi, and even bacteria. And so the understanding of that being, you know, how you describe being eco-literate, understanding how these systems work, and then being able to, in our communities and, through, and in global systems, to design and implement systemic responses like uh, sustainable regenerative agricultural practices, which aren't destroying those basic uh, webs of life that, that support us, I think is absolutely essential. And I wonder um, what other systemic solutions are you seeing? So one of the things we've talked about already is the sustainable agriculture and permaculture approach. What other kind of systemic responses are you seeing? And particularly maybe around the energy sector and and um, and in that that world, because that I know is something that's on many people's mind, particularly with the crisis in uh, in Europe at the moment. Well, uh, I think uh, the the energy problem uh, is potentially one of our greatest achievements, <clears throat> the solution to the energy problem, and one of our greatest hopes. And and uh, the work of Amory Lobbins, for example, at the Rocky Mountain Institute, but uh, of many others, has shown again and again that there is a roadmap uh, uh, toward a fossil-free future. This is no longer a technical problem, nor is it a conceptual problem, it's a political problem. It's the power of the fossil fuel industry that prevents us from going beyond uh, fossil fuels to alternative energy sources. And I should in this connection mention that there has been a lot of hoopla recently about nuclear fusion. And, you know, being a physicist, I have followed this for the last 50 years or so. And whenever you talk to fusion experts uh, about where the research stands and when will it be available for commercial use, you know, for 50 years, they have said, well, maybe a couple of decades. And they're still saying that today. And we don't have a couple of decades to, to wait for that. So uh, we have alternative energy sources. And again, there is no magic bullet. We cannot say the solution to the energy crisis are windmills or the solution is, you know, planting trees or the solution is, you know, solar panels on, on the roofs. It's all of that. It's, you know, wave power, hydropower, you know, all these various energy sources uh, that, that we have. And it's a question of organizing ourselves. And I should also mention that that uh, 
you know, alternative energy sources, fossil free energy have been tested repeatedly around the world on a small scale. So all we need to do is really scale them up. And for that, we need investment from governments, we need we need global coordination and so on. But it, it's not a technical problem. It's a problem of value and of political will. Mm. And and that's something that I've I've heard you say a lot, that we know what we need to do. It's about actually putting that political will behind it. And so yes, what- and I think more I- because of that, when, when you ask the question, we know so much about the state of the world. Why don't we solve our problems? We know, we know so much about the solutions. And, uh, you know, the answer is it's not just a conceptual issue, because if it were a conceptual issue alone, we would have convinced everybody. I mean, we have the good arguments, you know, we have the science, we have the Nobel laureates on our side, everything. But it's also a question of values, and maybe even more so a question of values. And this means that we need to talk about values to talk about ethics. And we need to uh, identify uh, and expose certain actions as immoral, like, for instance, investing in fossil fuels or or supporting fossil fuel companies financially, as governments around the world still do, you know, is immoral, and and we need we need to say so. And so, in many ways, too, that the the arguments aren't won by giving more information necessarily. The arguments happen and and land in people's consciousness and in their cultural <clears throat> consciousness when there's. There's a, there's a story that comes with that. And I wonder whether you could talk a little bit too about maybe story or narrative change or even weaving in a sort of a spiritual awareness. Well, I think uh, uh, I over the last few years, <clears throat> I've become more and more aware of the importance of community. I think by building communities, by building alternative communities, regenerative, sustainable communities, at least by trying and going in this direction, uh, I think this is the way to go. Because when we have communities, the people in the community have friends, they have relatives, they, they spread the word. Let me let me tell you a story from Austria where I was born and grew up and this is a story from I think the 1980s when I gave talks about systems thinking and management in in Austria and I met the director of a large company they happened to produce knives and forks you know silverware cutlery and they they were very well known in Austria, a large company, and they were a model company in terms of uh, uh, environmental protection, effluence of the company, and so on, going towards sustainability. And uh, those are usually the people I meet because the other companies don't invite me. <laughs> so uh, I asked this guy. Uh, what made him change? You know, what what made him adopt these quite radical uh, uh, measures? And he said it was my daughter. And <clears throat> he said when she was eighteen, uh, at her on her eighteenth birthday, I wanted to give her a car, and she said, "Daddy, I don't want a car, uh, but if you want to give me a horse, that would be great." So he bought her a horse. And then uh, one day uh, across the dinner table, she said, by the way, how are you dealing with the chemical effluence in your company, in your factories? And he told me, he said, you know, Greenpeace had come to me before and asked me the same question, and I could always handle them. But when my daughter asked me the question across the dinner table, I had to change. And that's when he made the radical change. And so I think this is why community is so is so important. Community and also the work that you've done too with 
eco-literacy, supporting younger people to develop up a sense of this systemic view of life. And I wonder whether you might just mention a little bit about um, that that aspect of the work. Yeah, well, I have I have worked in in education all my life, uh, mostly in higher education at the university level, but but also with uh, elementary schools, even kindergarten, uh, middle schools, and high schools. And some friends and I, in the 1990s, uh, in the early 1990s, founded an organization called Center for Eco Literacy. Uh, starting from the uh, realization that in order to build sustainable communities, we can learn a lot from nature because nature's ecosystems are sustainable communities of plants, animals, microorganisms. And so we need to learn the basic principles of ecology and we need to teach this in our schools. So we developed a, a pedagogy how to teach these principles of ecology, principles like you know networks, cycles, diversity, uh, dynamic balance, and so on, uh, at at the school level, and we collaborated with teachers. And I've done that for twenty years. I retired from it now, but for twenty years I worked with teachers. And uh, what we found very soon was that. We didn't need to teach the children. The teachers had that experience. We, we, if we could teach the teachers and teach them those principles of ecology, they found wonderful ways of expressing that in songs, in plays, in paintings, in sculptures, and and so on. And so that's that's what we have been doing. I remember going out to when I was visiting you in Berkeley. Um, going out to one that the school, uh, the edible garden school that the Alice was edible schoolyard, edible yes. schoolyard, yeah, phenomenal. They, they they had they decided that they wanted to turn a schoolyard which was asphalted into a garden, and over many years they did so, and then they organized the teaching in such a way that the garden became the center of their curriculum, and every class spent two hours a week in the garden. And so they were, they were, uh, the children were learning the principles of ecology in a sort of hands-on way by observing the plants grow. And, and then they went a step further and added a kitchen to the garden. And, and the students learned how to cook food. And and we found uh, quite amazing stories that that where kids would not touch spinach or broccoli uh, or uh, s- things like that when they found it in a in a restaurant or in a school kitchen when they grew it themselves they loved it and not only that they told their parents can we do that at home can we have this kind of organic food at home. And I remember too you talking about how some of the kids who really struggled at school started to flourish and thrive there, and and perhaps it's something to do with that sense of community, that sense of belonging, and that sense of purpose and creativity, and all those characteristics of life that you described before. Mm-hmm. That very simple act of connecting people in a garden can yes, bring yes. about this transformation, and also and also to be uh, effective growing uh, vegetables and fruits and growing a garden is not the same as being effective in math or English or or, or geography. And so the intelligence that was shown by the students in the garden was of a very different kind. And, And students who were not that great in the classroom might excel in the garden. And so that that helped too. Mm. I'm just going to step back a bit because you mentioned before about um, what switched on the uh, cutlery maker. What yeah. what switched you on in the very beginning, Fritjof? Well, uh, I think uh, it. Uh, I was uh, uh, a physicist in the 1960s. I graduated in the mid 60s from the University of Vienna. 
And at the same time, I became interested and involved in the counterculture of the 60s. You know, I, I was a hippie during 68, 67, 68, and to the, the mid 70s, that, that whole culture. And uh, I began to, uh, to read about Eastern philosophy, Eastern spirituality. I began to meditate. I began to experiment with psychedelics in the late 60s, early 70s. And almost immediately, I saw very significant parallels between the concepts of modern physics and the basic ideas of these spiritual traditions. And so spirituality was really the guiding thread that, that led me to write my first book, The Tao of Physics, where I compared the worldview of modern physics with the views of Eastern spirituality. And then at the very end of the book, in the, in the afterword, I observed that our society is really not consistent with this new view of physics of being of interconnectedness and and uh, the view of spirituality and so I did more research and got more interested in the broader picture and being interested in the broader picture forced me to move from physics to the life sciences because problems like health or you know management or psychology economics all have to do with living systems and physics cannot say anything about living systems so in the mid 80s i shifted my focus from physics to the life sciences i stopped my research in theoretical physics around maybe 85 86 something like that and since then, I've been working on this synthesis of the system's view of life. Mm. I I remember reading your book, The Turning Point. I, I have quite strong recollections of, of what happened in my mind as I was reading it, that synthesis that yeah. when everything came together, it was, it was almost like there were sparks that were happening. You know, when you see something for the first time or it, it just lands and this awareness this awakening happens and I'd come to that from a, a sense of, of being an activist in the peace movement and being incredibly concerned about nuclear war and and war in general and I remember reading in your book too about um, the military complex and how much focus we yeah we, that, that was that. a big part of of the turning point and in 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 the early 80s the book was published in 82. And then in 83 and 84, I was also active in the peace movement. I gave seminars about nuclear power. I, I went, you know, to demonstrations and, and so on. Yeah, that was a very heady time. Where and, do you think you know, we are sad now? To say, we, haven't, we haven't made much progress because now, again, there's tremendous danger of, of uh, nuclear catastrophe. And people don't just, uh, I'm, I'm really surprised. That that people don't step up with a Gandhian perspective, you know, and saying that these problems cannot be forced solved by violence and war. It needs cooperation. Uh, there, there is one uh, economist in the United States at Yale University, and who is one of the most uh, uh, acute uh, and brilliant uh, political observers, Jeffrey Sachs. And Jeffrey Sachs is one of the very few who constantly writes about the need to negotiate a peace agreement in Ukraine and the fact that we live in a multipolar world where we need dialogue and cooperation. That's his way of saying we live in a world where all the problems are systemically interconnected. He calls it a multipolar world where no one region or country can dominate the others. Mm. But I mean, he's he's a lone voice, unfortunately. And so I guess the the work that we all have is is amplifying these voices and speaking up and speaking yes. out is something that Absolutely. I feel really strongly when you know through connecting with your work, Rich Office, that part of our role, so even as educators in the permaculture world, is to be taking this 
systemic understanding and to be sharing that out and speaking it up, but then speaking together with other networks. So not just staying in a bubble, but rising up as that global civil society. And, yes. um, and another thing, Maura, that we haven't mentioned is that there is this obsession of economists and politicians with the illusion of economic growth, of of unlimited economic growth on a finite planet. It's absolutely insane. And so we need to speak up when people say, oh, we got 4% growth, 5% growth. This may be good, but it may not be good. You know, it's it's if the growth comes because of an export of weapons, then it's not good growth, it's bad growth. So we need to qualify growth. Growth, of course, is characteristic of all life. You know, all life grows, but not everything grows all the time and growth is not unlimited. So there's the urgent need of qualifying growth. Mm. Mm. I'm I'm going to sidestep a, a moment because I see behind you lots of pictures of you with the Dalai Lama. Yes. I wonder it's what actually, does the Dalai Lama have to say about all of this? <laughs> well, I uh, I met the Dalai Lama. I was fortunate to meet him several times, and like so many of us, I was deeply impressed by his uh, his uh, person and the way he speaks and. Uh, uh, when when he says you know love and kindness is my religion and and so on but this occasion that you see on these pictures was in prague at the symposium given by vaclav havel the the great uh, president uh, of czechoslovakia and the uh, brilliant playwright and dissident and so havel invited about 300 scientists, politicians, and spiritual leaders to a symposium, which he called Forum 2000. This was in 1997. And so we were all in this very ornate palace where the president uh, resides uh, in Prague, which is just known as the castle. And so there was a big... uh, gilded ornate hall with a long table and everybody was seated around the table and they had seated people alphabetically and believe it or not capra came next to dalai (laughs) (laughs) and so that's how i got to sit next to the dalai lama so i spent several days at this conference you know sitting next to the dalai lama and having discussions with him and of course, I really enjoyed that and was deeply moved. Mm, extraordinary. We need more of those sorts of, of gatherings, don't we, with, with yes. scientists yes. and religious leaders and pe- thinkers of of our of the leading figures of our time are coming together to think together, to speak yeah, up and together. Also, and also, you know, the Dalai Lama is one who puts ethics on the table, you know, and, and values and... Uh, love and kindness. When he gave his talk at this symposium, I remember very well, he had a a manuscript and he said, this is the manuscript of my talk, but there are many very long words that I don't understand. And so I'm going to put it aside and I'm going to speak just from the heart, which which he did and which of course is brilliant. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it may have been a little bit of showmanship, you know, but <laughs> it was brilliant nevertheless. What I love too about permaculture is that it does put ethics front and centre. That is the core part of what I see coming through and what I think drew me to permaculture in the first instance, that at its heart is this constant questioning around how how can this, you know, the earth care, people care, fair share ethics, like how is what I'm doing be contributing to the care of the earth how is what i'm doing contributing to the care of humanity everywhere and how is this done in a way that that is um ensuring that um, other species future generations other cultures have access to to the what they need to live well morak do you do you speak about the community of life at at permaculture is that a term you use yeah yeah this is 
This is the term used by the Earth Charter. I'm I'm a member of the Earth Earth Charter Council, and <clears throat> I'm very impressed by this declaration of 16 ethical principles and values, mm. as they say, for creating a sustainable, just, and peaceful future. Mm. Um, before I open up for some questions, so feel free if you've got some questions to maybe drop them into the chat um, as a maybe do them in caps because that way I can see them um, more easily. Um, and while you're doing that, or maybe pop your hand up if you want to speak, um, you know, just speak it out, that's also fine. But what I wanted to um, ask you about was this notion that I remember you saying uh, in either in the course or when you were speaking with the youth that we all belong to two communities of life, that and that sense of belonging is really important. So could you maybe yes. describe what those communities of life that connect us all are? Yes. Well, uh, first let me say, Morak, that, that it helps to see ethics not just connected with philosophy or religion, but simply as behavior for the common good. So ethics is always related to community. When, you, when we belong to a community, we show our belonging by behaving in a certain way, and we behave for the benefit of the community. And of course, in our daily lives, we belong to many communities. Uh, you know, I belong to a scientific community. I belong to a community of tennis players. I belong to you know, my family, the Austrian community, and so on and so forth. But we all share these two communities. We are all members of humanity, and we are members of the Earth household, which is the original meaning of oikos, the Greek root word of ecology. So we are members of Gaia, the Earth household. And as members of the Earth household, we should behave like the other members of the household be behave, uh, the plants, animals, and microorganisms that have sustained life for billions of years. So this is the very essence of ecological sustainability. And as members of the human community, we should respect human dignity and human rights, which is, of course, another big subject. Mm, thank you for articulating that. Now, there's questions that are jumping in on the <coughs> chat, and then we'll go to you, Mansour. It's lovely to see you here. So let me just begin. Um, Daniela. Hi, Daniela. Thank you for being here. Um, Daniela's asked, how would you explain your findings to a 10-year-old? And what should future generations do? That's two big questions there. But maybe, let's, yeah, how do you communicate this to young people? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I... I thought about that a lot in, in my work in the Center for Ecoliteracy in the 1990s and the 2000s. And I haven't thought about this recently, but, uh, you know, as I discovered this, these four characteristics of life that I, I presented to you, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking now that you could, you could talk to a 10 year old about intelligence, about creativity, about regeneration, about networks. You know, the great thing about our youth today is that they are growing up in social networks with the social media. So we don't need to explain to a young person what a network is. You know, they have a visceral experience of living in networks. So that's a very good start. Mm. I would start with that. Um, and just as as you were speaking to, I was imagining a beautiful art artistic book that is describing these dimensions of life. That would yes, be yes, way to could share. be. Yes. Mm. Another question's come in from uh, Miguel Loyola. Thank you. Um, saying, what other books and resources that uh, have helped to frame your mind on this? Like who who and what has helped to frame your mind? Like who should people be looking to behind your thinking? Who would you point to? Well, this is, of course, uh, you know, a long list of, uh, of, of people. And, 
you know, I can just uh, suggest, Miguel, that you go to my website, my personal website, which is fritjofcapra.net, and there you will find a map, a conceptual map of my colleagues and mentors that have influenced me. And there are about maybe 50 of them. Uh, organized, the map is organized according to the interconnected concepts of the system's view of life. So you have an ecology section, a social section, you have a cognitive consciousness section, spirituality, and so on. And uh, it would take me too long to, to mention names, but there are about, about 50 of them. But let me mention uh, two, two recent books that that I really enjoyed. And they are about what I mentioned before, the intelligence of plants and fungi. One is by an Italian botanist, Stefano Mancuso, and it is called, it's published in English also, and it's called The Revolutionary Genius of Plants. And it's an absolutely amazing book. The other one is by a uh, fungal scientist or mycologist by the name of Merlin Sheldrake, and it's called Entangled Life. And it is about his work as a mycologist and about the world of fungi. Both of those are absolutely fascinating books. Mm, thank you for, for bringing those forward and thank you for the question. Um, I'm going to bring you in, Mansoor. I'm going to spotlight you and uh, if you'd like to unmute and um, come and ask your question. Welcome and hello. Yes. Hello, Mansoor. I should mention that Mansoor is, uh, has been one of the first Capra course alumni and has been very active ever since. And we have had many interactions and it's great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Gabra. Uh, what am I actually wanted to just share here that we are not putting the perspective, the teaching of Capra and also the uh, all system thinkers and network think thinkers in a perspective to see that we are living, there's a deep simplicity that we are missing it. And that's the whole system, the universe, earth, and everything like our body is a self-organizing system. And the, the pattern of uh, organization is not linear network. And since it's mathematical, it's giving us the essential behavior of the self-organizing living system. And how we apply that in our body, as a metaphor to see where is the disconnect comes, which is domination of linear mind that we created, that uh, approximate model that we created through our self-conscious process. And how we apply, we separated ourselves from the universe through that illusively. And even when that dominates in our mind, it separates our brain and from the body network and goes for self uh, self-assertiveness, short-term gain, and domination. So that separation that we are not acting like other animals, other species, and all this too, it comes within us because of domination of that linear mind. And by seeing it and, and somehow uh, seeing our brain as a self-organizing system that it, by observation, it could shift and self-organize itself to uh, Synchronized left and right, which is more uh, left of masculine and uh, logical to the right that is intuitive and uh, spiritual and uh, feminine. Eventually, we can get the best, the most capacity of the, our brain. And that change and shift that we are looking for to start within our body network and apply to any network that we are participating in. And that gives us a very simple, but at the same time, very uh, deep uh, solution to any network that we are participating. And even that self-consciousness that we went through is it was part of the Earth's self-conscious process that's already been achieved through our work of Capra and others too. And we are not looking at it at that perspective, to look at it philosophically and spiritually, and also to come up with a solution that all we need to know how, because all the nonlinear networks, they behave universal. 
And thank you know you. one, you can apply it to others. I'm sorry that I <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mansur. I want to ever give Bridget a chance to respond and then we have um, Mansur, I, I would even go further and make a link to spirituality and to meditation, because in meditation we are taught to use our organism as an instrument for for knowing and for experiencing certain certain truths. And and so that is very much along the lines that you were mentioning. Mm. Thank you. We are intuitively, we can get it, get the information intuitively rather than because of the, uh, we, when we activate our right side brain and become intuitive, then we don't have to even read. We just get it from the bigger network, bigger internet, that earth network, which is higher conscious than we are. Mm. But but. As an author, I would say reading is not bad either. <laughs> <laughs> but we got that through reading. reading of your books, right? <laughs> your, your Thank you, Mansoor. Uh, so I see that we've gone um, to the top of the hour. There are other questions in in the chat that we haven't been able to get to, and I apologize for that. Um, I do want to let you know that if you'd like to save the chat in the little space where you type in your message, there's three dots there. Um, if you click on those, it'll give you a chance to save the chat. We'll also save the chat and share it with the recording as well. But if you wanted to have it on your own desktop right now, um, go ahead there. Um, I wonder whether there's something that we might be able to close this session with, Fritch, off, uh, kind of a, a, a message of, of ways in which you feel could be the most appropriate that we can move forward uh, or um, a message of uh, peace and hope and positivity to uh, to step out into this world and this conversation from so are you addressing this to me or to I was addressing it to you <laughs> sorry <Huh? Richard. laughs> I was I was thinking you know what what is at the end of this session that can bring together some of the key threads that we've been talking about in a way that we can step out and you know, I, would, I would come back to community and uh, in particular to uh, a learning community that meets to learn things. And this is, you know, the alumni in my Capra course are a learning community that is growing. We have now almost 3,000, you know. Uh, with, uh, you know, Morag being one of them and Mansur being another one. And so uh, I think what happens in a learning community, uh, especially of the kind of systemic thinkers and activists, what happens in a learning community is that while you are discussing conceptual relationships, you experience human relationships because the community forms as a network of human relationships, which means that the conceptual dimension is enhanced by an emotional dimension, which is very powerful. And this is why learning communities are so effective. And I experienced this for the first time in the early 1990s, when Morag and I met at Schumacher College, where we were a learning community to stayed together in a physical place for five weeks, not only studying together, but also cooking together, cleaning the building, gardening, and so on. It was a very intense intellectual and emotional five weeks. But uh, it need not be that intense. Any type of learning community has both these uh, intellectual and emotional components, and why it is so powerful. So I, you know, I I want to end by thanking everybody for joining us. And this is one type of learning community, and by continuing to engage with our learning community and and with other learning communities. Mm, thank you, Fritjof. And I and I think at this point too, just to let people know that Fritjof's. Next course will be opening in a in few weeks. weeks' time. Yes. And there's still some places. It's filling up fast. But if you would like to join Fritjof's learning community and be part of that ongoing alumni network, Stacey's going to drop in uh, the link to the Capra course so you can sign up there. Um, and I, I'm there 
all the time as well with uh, hosting a group of young people that Fritjof um, kindly offers us the support to to bring in young people to develop up this eco-literacy. And we now have a, a growing alumni of, of youth um, working through this course too. And I would love to invite you to keep coming back to our learning community um, here at the Permaculture Education Institute. Like I said, we host these sorts of conversations every month um, as a masterclass. We also have a, a film club that happens every um, couple of weeks after this, also exploring different uh, works. And we're hoping to screen Fritjof's um, film Mind Walk when it's uh, remastered. Um, and hopefully we'll get some information from Fritjof about that soon. And I also host uh, something called the Permaculture Education Institute, which I approach as being very much a learning community as well. And we have a space called Hive where many groups are coming in to explore this together. So um, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's been such a delight to have your company. And thank you particularly um, to Fritjof for taking the time to come and explore these ideas with us. Um, I'm so grateful for your for sharing so fully here today and really lifting up the conversation in, in uh, where, where we can go and what we need to be paying attention to at this most critical moment in, in uh, humanity's uh, history. Well, thank you, Morak, and thank you all for joining, and let's have a big bye-bye wave. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs> bye. See you. Thanks you so much, Big Jeff, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Maura. Bye. Thanks, you. Bye. Have a good morning. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take thank care. you. That was amazing. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming. Take care, everyone. Bye.